I mean, look, Jeremy Lin's story is, is relatable, is a universal story that you're black, white, Asian, Mexican, anything, you can, you can relate to. Because everyone knows what it's like to, to chase your dream and fail, you know. You know, nothing wrong with Yao Ming, but Yao Ming was seven foot six. At 12 years old, they knew he was gonna be an NBA player. They knew that he was, he was, he was groomed to become that. No one thought Jeremy Lin at 12 was gonna be in the NBA. I've been watching basketball for a long time, and that's, that was a weird, very weird phenomenon. You have a guy who was basically sleeping on someone's couch, you know, and, and is the 15th man on the team, you know, that came in and set the record for the most amount of points scored, you know, for a starter, you know, in the first three games. You know, he went like 25, 28, you know, you know to, uh, to almost 30 points, something like that, in each of these games, you know. And that whole thing was just very strange because you've never seen anybody who just came, came out, out of the blue and was just electrifying the garden like he was. I'm not a father yet, but like I, I felt like the proudest father that you could ever imagine, right? Because it was, it was just, okay, finally. I remember at the time I would joke to friends a lot that I found the idea of like a black president like impossible to fathom. And this was obviously much lower stakes, but this was on that level of things I could not fathom. I can't remember a two-week period where I was more excited at any time the Knicks played. Uh, I can't remember a time when like, I knew more Asian kids that I was friends with or that I would even just see around, walking around the city who were like, <laughs> in such like weird spirit of camaraderie. Um, I think it was, I don't I think it was actually probably one of the most important moments for Asian Americans of my generation at least. Uh, Actually, it might have just been the most important one in terms of like a collective good feeling. Certainly there have been bad things that happened, but uh, in terms of sort of rallying the base or whatever, it was really sort of, yeah, I can't, it was the, it was the best. <laughs> I, I would probably have told people I'm Taiwanese American. <laughs> sort of Korean American, that's how obsessed I was. I remember being a, in a, in a, in a, like a, dinner party type of thing. It was like a charity event. And I am not a person that goes up to people at all. I'm pretty introverted, believe it or not. And some, there were like two people that were wearing Jeremy Lin jerseys. And I, and I went straight up to them and I was like, pretty awesome, right? <laughs> that was the craziest thing. I don't do that. And there was like, yeah, it was like we could talk. And they weren't Asian, they were, they were definitely not Asian people. People were just rooting for this thing to happen. Um, I, I just think that if you talk negatively about it, you hit, you're a terrible person. Um, I think Jeremy was major. Uh, I, don't, I wouldn't say that all the pressure's on him to have changed the lives of us getting girls or whatever, or how we're seen in the dating scene. You know? It definitely helps. One, <laughs> one fond memory I have of Lynn's sanity is when the rumors started that he was maybe dating Kim Kardashian or Kim Kardashian was angling for an intro um, or somebody was trying to hook them up. And I ended up writing a post like, who should be Jeremy Lynn's girlfriend? Um, and, <laughs> you know, with her, I was like, no, fuck no. We don't want to screw up his life. Um, but, yeah, I think to me that was, I mean, you, and you see where the Kardashians are today. I mean, they're ubiquitous. To me, that was almost like, oh, we made it. There was obviously the, the maybe, I mean, it's not on purpose, casual racism that was happening. And, you know, people just d d didn't know the right words to say uh, about Jeremy and things like that. But also, like, at one of the bars we were watching the game at, it was halftime of the game, and some guy just turns around to me and is like, oh, hey, Jamie Lynn, I didn't know you, you, you were in here. I was like, yeah, but, I mean, how are you going to deal with it? And I just said to him, no, no, I always grab a drink at halftime. I'm going right back. You know, I, it's, it's just you can, I can get mad at this guy, or I can just make a joke, and he's kind of like, oh, okay, I guess I made a stupid joke. I remember thinking that was kind of funny that uh, up until that point, you know, uh, the sort of names you would get called were, you know, the same things like Jackie Chan or Bruce Lee or... Yao Ming even, uh, and Jeremy's 
ascent to fame kind of gave, you know, people who wanted to taunt anybody uh, another name sort of in their vocabulary to use, I guess. When something is happening that brings your community into the light that is not used to being covered, um, there's also like a little bit of nervousness, nervous tension, because you know as a member of the media that it could also go fairly wrong. So um, there were a lot of missteps in the way people covered Jeremy Lin, and that started happening very early on. Um, and so I was part of a team of people that wrote like sort of a style guide to covering Jeremy Lin, which is sort of a little bit ridiculous, but we felt it was necessary. There had been a number of missteps in the media, you know, people are constantly using like fortune cookies, which is not an Asian American, you know, not a, a Chinese thing to like promote games. That's not maybe that's not a good example, but you know, um, you know, there was. Uh, I, I always like to mention this because people like to forget. You know, a, a prominent sports journalist, Jason Whitlock, made a tweet that referenced the size of Jeremy Lin's penis, which to Asian Americans, you know, I don't know if he thought that was just like a funny dude joke, a sophomore dude joke, but to Asian Americans, that's like serious fighting words. Um, there were people that used the word chink inappropriately, and they said, oh, I just, you know, a chink in the armor, this is a common phrase. Come on now, are people not um, well-trained enough in newsrooms to know that a word like that is problematic when you're talking about Asian Americans? To this day, thinking about that tweet still enrages me. It still makes me feel like no matter how much change, no matter how much uh, progress we've made in terms of being a part of so many different systems, uh, rising to levels of prominence in other spaces, there are still worlds in which Asian Americans, because we're not included, because we're not a part of that conversation, are seen as, uh, if you will, kind of ready targets. I think people didn't know how to handle it. I think people didn't know how to handle the race factor in it because all of a sudden he just burst onto the scene and became this sensation. And the fact of the matter is, is that he's Asian. So I think it was something like people were in a panic mode, like, okay, how do we handle this now? Because, you know, we have to say great things about him, but he's Asian and there's so many different headlines that we could use, but it could be offensive, but let's just put it out there because we think this is positive because this is great. America doesn't handle Asian American identity with the care and concern and I think fear that they handle other identities of color in America because they don't fear Asian people. They underestimate us. So writers think it's okay to have a headline on ESPN saying chink in the armor or two inches of pain or constantly saying, oh, he's deceptively quick. We didn't expect this because they underestimate us all the time. But when you speed things up to 2016 and you see the way America fears Muslims, the way America fears the black community, and the way that America goes into these communities and literally hunts individuals down, as a Taiwanese Chinese American, you say to yourself, maybe it's better we aren't feared, and maybe it's better we're forgotten, and maybe it's better we're underestimated. In, in a way, it's very good that Jeremy's success um, put a lot less pressure on the younger generation. That is to say, well, you know, with his success, uh, hopefully they'll convince their parents and uh, not just keep hopping on studies. And, and there are many other possible career choices. Um, but the downside also, of course, is now the parents will say, wow, now with Jeremy's success, uh, not only you need to do well in studies, but you also should be good an athlete. How many times do we experience like something truly magical in our lives, especially in our adult lives? You know, when we're kids and you see fireworks, that's like mind blowing. But when you're an adult and you see fireworks, it's like you smell the smoke. You're wondering how, what this is doing for the environment. You know, you're like, this is super loud. I'm uncomfortable. I think that Jeremy Lin gave us like real fireworks, like real, real magic. To see this guy who's 6'3", and he's not skinny, he's 200 pounds. Like he's 6'3", 200 pounds. He could potentially be a wide receiver. And he's got these, his, he's fast, he's muscular, he's strong. He's got great eye-hand coordination, a great presence on the basketball court. Um, so, I mean, Listen, I think he's, he's certainly paving the way for a lot of younger 
Asian kids out there. And I think that's going to be that's going to be really interesting to watch. Um, I don't think we're going to really see that for probably another 10 to 15 years. That's kind of what we saw with Siri Park and, and golf and Serena Williams in the tennis world. You don't really get to see his impact come to fruition roughly until, you know, a couple decades later. The NBA universe was re revolving around Jeremy Lin. He had two Sports Illustrated covers in a row. He was on ESPN every day. Every newspaper was heralding him as this great new celebrity. And so in Miami, when he goes to play the eventual NBA champion Miami Heat, the players on the Heat argued among themselves over who got to guard him. This is LeBron James, this is Dwayne Wade, this is pretty much a set of five players argued over who could pick him up full court. And full court isn't just what you do to a good player, it's what you do when you want to destroy a player, when you want to shame a player. And so that game where he has eight turnovers and goes one for a million from the field, that was a function of the NBA fighting back. This is the NBA asserting there's a hierarchy here, and this is a nice Cinderella story, but now it's time for you to go back into your pumpkin. Uh, currently in the NBA, he's like probably in the middle, bottom of the pack, depending, which is great, which is great. I mean, I would take him, I would objectively take him over half of the other point guards in the league, which is funny because the Nets had this point guard, Jared Jack, who played with them last year. Journeyman, he's a good player. He's played in a lot of teams. And when they signed Jeremy Lin, he went to Twitter, and people think he was subtweeting the move where he just laughed like, ha, 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 LOL, whatever. But Jeremy Lin is a better player than Jared Jack. But culturally, he's not really part of the NBA in the same way. So what Jared Jack was actually saying wasn't that I'm a better player than Jeremy Lin, it's that why would you replace someone like me for someone like him? Like I'm part of this locker room, I have friends here, I'm part of this culture. This guy, you're gonna replace me with him? I think the frustration right now for Jeremy Lin fans is man, can't we see him uh, you know, with the right coach, with the right system. I'm hoping that that might be the Brooklyn Nets um, because you have a, a coach who was formerly with the New York Knicks who knows what Jeremy's strengths are and how he, you know, how he best functions and, and plays as a player. Uh, you know, I hesitate because the only Nets that I know of right now are Brooke Lopez and uh, Bojan Bogdanovic, and then you see the rest of their roster. And I'm reminded of a scene from Major League where they're, they lo they're looking at the roster and they're like, who are these fucking guys? <laughs> 10 years from now, I don't think we're going to talk to a 16-year-old kid who's, you know, who's Asian American who's looking to be in the NBA, and, and he's going to necessarily say, well, I'm, I'm doing this because Jeremy Lin did. But I think if he makes it in the NBA, he'll probably call Jeremy Lin and say, how do you deal with this? No, it's not, it's not being that average is enough. It's that he was spectacular for long enough. I, I think that's the important point. Um, he can be average. I mean. An average player, if he never had a breakup, would have still been a breakthrough for us. Um, I, I think that he was, but he was spectacular in a way that, that goes down in the history of the NBA. Like he made stuff happen that will go down in the books. And so that is incredible. It's not just that he, you know, it's like, so anything after that point is gravy. Um, you know, I don't know. He could, have been he could have been average and it still would have mean meant something, but he was spectacular and um, that just means no one's ever going to forget.